our guest speaker tonight will be Patrick McCartney. And uh, he is actually a master mountain gardener and expert in the field at CSU Extension. And he's been helping to educate our Summit County gardeners and also helping us to um, develop our high country food programs for success. And I understand you're going to be around to check on us from time to time this summer yes, to see how all of our gardens are growing. Um, tonight, Pat is going to talk about soil amendments, fertilizers, cover crops, and long-term soil improvement programs for high country soils. So without further ado, let us welcome Pat. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak with you here in Summit County. We've been coming this direction for about 10 years now, working with master gardeners and some of the community gardens here. Uh, unfortunately, I don't spend full time here, but uh, I'm available to help out. Uh, and uh, sometimes the soil thing is very, very challenging for us, and it's great to have some basic knowledge of that. And there's a few key points that I'll probably hammer on a little bit tonight. Uh, but uh, if you can get those, I think it's very, very beneficial for us. Uh, sometimes we need to find out what actually applies in the area that we're at. And uh, in the Rocky Mountains, it's so important the microclimate of the place that you live at. Are you on a south-facing slope? Are you on a north-facing slope? Are you in the bottom of the valley? Are you up on the mountain? It's so important weather-wise. It's also very, very important soil-wise because if you're on a side hill, you might not have very much soil to work with. If you're in the bottom of the valley, you may have some great soils to work with. Uh, so it's very, very important, the microclimate that we're dealing with. Some of the community gardens here, we have some great microclimates. We've also done some additional things with amendments to help them out tr tremendously. One of the things that I always talk about is a soil test and the value of a soil test. If you're new to the area, if you are struggling gardening, or if you would just like to find out the basics of your soils uh, to get a soil test done is a very, very productive thing to do. How would you go about that? Well, if this room were your garden, you would walk across here, take numerous samples from the top six to eight inches of the soil, maybe one sample from, from lower. You can do this with a shovel. You can do it with a soil probe. You can do it with a spoon from your kitchen if you're okay doing it with that. Uh, but we just need to take a number of small samples, put them in a clean plastic bucket, let that air dry, we don't want to microwave it or do anything like that because that can change the results, let it air dry. From that we need about a pint to a pint and a half of soil. That soil then we will put in a, in a clean container, a uh, plastic bag, a Ziploc bag, medium Ziploc bag is about how much soil you need to submit to a soils lab. There are a number of good soils labs. Colorado State University has a great soil, water, and plant testing lab. That information is on uh, the internet, so that's a good way to go there. What you want is a routine soil test. A routine soil test is going to give you the information that you need to improve your garden or a farm type scenario. Uh, so we talked about obtaining a good sample. After that's air dried, you'd want to submit it to the lab, give them your contact information, also uh, give them a little bit of history. This is a, used to be a pasture and now it's going to be a garden, or this is a lawn area that's struggling. Give them a little bit of history. You can ask for a recommendation. The lab can give you a recommendation. I'd much rather give you a recommendation after we get that analysis sheet back. You'll get the analysis sheet back at the same time you get the bill. They don't, they don't bill you uh, as you turn it in. They'll send the, you the bill or fax you the bill along with the analysis sheet. Also, there are some good private labs you can work with. You can work with uh, Grand Junction Labs in Grand Junction. Servitech Labs is another good lab. There's a, there's a number of good private labs that also do uh, soil testing. The results should be similar. 
we took similar samples and turned them into two or three, three labs, they should all come back very, very similar. Uh, probably best to use a lab that is familiar with intermountain soils, so uh, we probably wouldn't benefit to send them off to Ohio State University or something like that. Uh, there may be some differences there because they're going to look at it from the standpoint of a place that has acid-type acid soils. Okay, that routine soil test is going to give you nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. It's going to give you the texture of your soil. And if you don't get anything else out of tonight, the texture of your soil is if it is a sand particle. We all know what sand is. Pretty large. A silt particle, a clay particle, or a combination of these, which would be ideally a loam. So that's uh, the texture of your soil. I have a great sample here of a clay soil. How would you know it's a clay soil? Well, could be an adobe brick, uh, number one. Uh, has very little organic matter in it, as you'll see when I pass this around. Uh, when it dries, it tends to crack with large cracks in it. Uh, you can take and make a ribbon out of it when it's wet, uh, and that is a sample of a clay-type soil, very common in the Intermountain West. One of the weak links we often have is uh, in nitrogen. Nitrogen is needed by plants to provide the green, but also to provide to provide growth over the season to keep a healthy, vigorous plant. And generally in the Intermountain West, one of the weak links that we have is low organic matter. Related to that, uh, the low organic matter is, re is related to low nitrogen. We would like to see an ideal soil have about 5% organic matter. Oftentimes we can have much less than this. In mountain type scenarios, we can have even more than that, and that would be in a place where it stays mucky all the time. So we don't want too much organic matter, it'll stay too wet. We want the right organic matter because that's a precursor to the amount of nitrogen in the soil. It's also very, very necessary for the plants. Back to the soil test results. The texture, it's also going to give you the pH. Uh, we can vary in pH. We tend to go to uh, basic or alkaline rather than the other the other direction and is that a problem well generally not in high mountain soils but it can be as we work our way down the river valleys nitrogen phosphorus and potassium npk those are the three major nutrients that are needed by the plant we talked about nitrogen already and certainly in many instances we need more of it in order to have a good healthy vigorous plant over the course of the season. Phosphorus, sometimes we can have a need for phosphorus in the Intermountain West. That's one of them that's really good to get your soil analysis sheet back and see where you're at with phosphorus. Potassium or potash, the K, that's one of them that we don't generally need in the Intermountain West. We have plenty of it in our soils. We also tend to have a lot of it in our water. So in very, very rare instances would we need any uh, potassium uh, in our uh, fertilizer. There's a number of micronutrients, some of them that can be very, very important. Boron, zinc, manganese, all of those kind of things. Most of our native soils in Colorado are very good with most of these other than boron, but interestingly enough, the soil test results will show low boron Yet if we add boron, we don't get much of a plant response, so there's not generally a reason to supply it specifically. Most of our soils are pretty good from the micronutrient standpoint. Results should be similar from the, from the different labs that you get back. Uh, some of the uh, lab analysis sheets seem cumbersome to read, some of them are a little bit easier to read, but I am available to help with that. We've looked at uh, virtually hundreds of them down through the years, and, and uh, that's my uh, cell phone number that I put up there, the 
210-610-6093. Be happy to walk you through that analysis sheet once you get it back from the lab. We'll take a look at it. You can read me the numbers or fax me one and we'll, we'll take a look at it. Now, another uh, take home is uh, soil, amendments, fertilizers, and mulches. What's, what's the difference? Well, I think we all know what a soil is, but one of, the com one of the components there is the nutrient values there that are carried in nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, those micronutrients and all those kind of things, which we can be low in. So what do we do? Well, we either put a fertilizer or an amendment on there. An amendment generally is to help with the texture of your soil. It generally is not to provide a tremendous amount of nutrients which would be supplied by a fertilizer. Now, what is a mulch? Well, a mulch is something that we put on top of the soil to help with those texture problems, also to help with moderating in temperature uh, and uh, keeping a good soil moisture over an extended period of time. So there's a big difference between the fertilizer, the amendment, and the mulch. We, we want to realize the differences there. Uh, but again, what do we do if we have a problem with the soil scenario? Well, we can add an amendment to help with the texture. That amendment also may have some nutrient value, such as a, let's use good, well-aged compost. The compost may have some nitrogen values, certainly could have some phosphorus values and, and some micronutrient values. So we use this to change the soil that we have into a better scenario. Fertilizers can often do that too. Fertilizers are generally purchased not to help with the texture of the soil, but to help with the fertility of the soil. One of the big differences in the use of conventional type fertilizers, the kind of fertilizer that you would go buy at the, at the big lot store in a bag, versus organic, is that generally we're applying to fit the needs, immediate needs of the growth year with a conventional kind of fertilizer, where theoretically an organic fertilizer, we're building the soil. We're not necessarily, it doesn't really matter that we're growing beets on that this year, or that, we're, or that it's uh, a garden situation, a lawn situation, or whatever. We just want to do good things for the soil and build the soil. So, an organic situation, we want to help build that soil and the related microbes over time. Uh, we want to help with the physical and chemical and mineral facets of it. We want to do this continuing amendment kind of thing. We might want to do some mulching. Uh, Back to the soil test, we determine what the needs are for your area, take a long-term approach to try and change those, and amazingly enough, and yet not really when you think about it, the places in the Intermountain West where I go and they have a, bit, a beautiful lawn, beautiful garden, generally those are long-term residents who have been routinely amending their soil for a long, long time. Maybe have lived there 20 years and have gardened, and have just routinely added manures, maybe use some compost teas, those kind of things, uh, and just continue to, to build and to try and maintain a good amount of organic matter over time. Uh, the other thing is, I think as you stay in a place longer, you learn what works and what doesn't work, and we tend to go with the direction of, well, if it works, we keep doing it. If it doesn't work so well, we might try it one more time, but probably not continue it over, over many years. Good amendments. Well, amazingly, one of the really good amendments in the Inner Mountain West is uh, a clean, well-aged, well-composted horse manure. One of the reasons for this is because it has a large particle size. So if we take something that has a large particle size and we mix it in with something that has a very, very small particle size, the clay, or even a medium uh, particle size, then it opens up that soil. It allows air and water to move in that soil. One of the things with the clay soil uh, is air doesn't move through that either. That, ad that adobe looking brick thing there, air doesn't move through there. Air needs to move 
through soils in order for roots to grow. Uh, just a very, very ba basic thing. Your own homegrown, homemade compost. If you've been composting for a period of time and you have adequate leaves, lawn clippings, those kind of things that you can put in there, that's a great way to help build your soils is with the use of that kind of compost. And I've seen some really good two or three uh, tier systems, two or three uh, box type systems for home composting where the things go in on one side and, uh, and the other side is a two or three year later where you're taking it out and it can work very, very well. I would caution you not to take in things from neighbors, friends, relatives, unless you know that they're not using chemicals on them. Peat moss is always a great soil amendment for us. Uh, it's something that's going to help lighten that soil. It's something where if you took a couple of inches and spaded it in or rotor tilled it in, it's going to help you out. Uh, any good source of organic matter. Now, we start going into, well, what about straw? Well, straw really isn't that great unless it would have been composted because anything like straw or mulch, uh, wood chips, those kind of things, they are going to take the, they're going to tie up the nitrogen as they continue to decay. So they're actually going to increase the need for nitrogen in your soil. That's why things like straw, bark mulch, chips are much better as a mulch than they are as an amendment. Uh, one thing you can do is put them on top as a mulch for a few years, then to work them in, so basically they become an amendment. Now, bark nuggets would take a number of years before you would do that, but some things like straw, maybe in the next year or two years you can work them in. I tried newspapers years and years ago for weed control and that kind of thing. And in our scenario, they didn't break down fast at all. They were very, very slow to break down. I assume if you were in an, in an acid soil type scenario where you had lots of rainfall, they would break down fairly fast, but they didn't break down uh, very fast at all for us. And I was very uh, disappointed with the use of newspapers as a, as a uh, mulch. We would probably apply organics just over time, whether it be every month, every two months, uh, the fish type products, the sprays, uh, that would be something where maybe you would want to use them every month. Uh, not, extra, not readily available to the plant, as are some of the commercial synthetics, and yet uh, the, the availability would continue over time. That's like with the breakdown of manures, uh, most of the nutrients there are going to happen in the are going to be available to those plants. Half of them in the first year or two, half continued over many years. So that's why the addition of a manure or, or a well-aged, well-rotted compost to a soil helps you over an extended period of time. <coughs> two things that can be very beneficial from the standpoint of fertilizer in our area is iron and sulfur and uh, oftentimes with the tight clay soil and the higher pH our iron that we have our native the red that you see in many of the mountain areas is not very available to plants so if we supply an iron in a form that's more readily available that can be very beneficial <coughs> sulfur is one of the original uh, fungicides, bactericides, and it still acts that way in soils, so it's very good from that standpoint. Uh, also, it helps to buffer the high pH. If we did have a higher pH type scenario and just added a few pounds of elemental sulfur to our garden area, it would help buffer that pH some. We'll only bring it down a small amount, but it, it can help in that regard. Often have people who uh, do some things because uh, I call them wives' tales or handed down or whatever. But uh, oftentimes they're kind of fun. Uh, I have people that put a penny in with the tomato plant when they plant their tomato plants. Uh, I have people that put Epsom salts in there, and uh, a 
penny. I don't. I think if you weighed it at the beginning of the season and dug the penny out at the end of the season and then weighed it again, I don't think it's probably the, the amount of loss is negligible. But a lot of these people swear that that helps their tomato plant. You know, if it does, keep doing it. That's about all I can say. <laughs> the Epsom salt thing. It, there is a reason for that, but in the in an Intermountain West, generally we don't much we don't have a need for lime, we don't have a need for gypsum, uh, and we probably don't have a need for Epsom salt in there just because of the chemical makeup of our soils. But if you've been doing that and you're convinced it works, well, I keep doing it, okay? Uh, and who am I to say? But uh, one of the things, you know, one of the things that we do is we promote things that are scientifically sound. Research has proven them to be beneficial. If I see things out and about that I see that are working, I certainly will tell them to you. Uh, there's lots of snake oil salesmen out there. Lots of people selling things that uh, may or may not work in your scenario. And uh, there used to be some nationally syndicated garden shows on TV, and they're great shows if you lived in many of those areas where it's applicable. But the Intermountain West is a place that it, most of it you can just kind of throw away, to be real honest with you, because they were dealing with acid soil type conditions. They were dealing with places where you would want to use a lot of lime, where you would possibly use the Epsom salt, where you would use the gypsum, uh, and a lot of the things that they do to make plants survive and thrive and do very, very well are things that if you did here, you'd be going the wrong direction. You'd be making them <coughs> tougher for your plants. So uh, do we have great knowledge in the Intermountain West of gardening? Yeah, we actually do have, but uh, we don't have it on a nationally syndicated TV show, obviously. So uh, there are a lot of snake oil salespeople out there. Uh, Oftentimes those people are involved in selling fertilizer and or plant uh, amendment type products and uh, I just be aware of that and, and know that uh, uh, it may not be something that works real well for you. This is a Ross root feeder and it doesn't, Ross is just the, the kind of the manufacturer. There are a number of other needle type root feeders and this hooks to your hose there also is a small canister that goes here that you can put fertilizer in. And this is one of the really, really great gizmos for helping trees and shrubs acclimate to start with. And then also to help reinvigorate them. And I'm not talking about the use of the fertilizer in the canister. I'm talking about just putting it in, put, hooking it up to your hose. The water goes out these little holes in the bottom under pressure and it blows airspace, it blows pore space into our old tight soil that we have in our area, especially the, if we tend to have a clay type soil. We work our way around the tree. We can do that over the course of an evening. We can do that over the course of the summer to work our way around your trees and shrubs. Uh, it can help regenerate them because it provides that important pore space, which is first, the water where the water has blown it open. Next it's where air can move about, which then is followed by new root growth. It's a, it's a root stimulator, a very inexpensive root stimulator. So that's, uh, that's my first show and tell. The second one, uh, this isn't really a soil product, although it's certainly a natural product, and it's uh, diatomaceous earth. I don't know if you're familiar with diatomaceous earth. Uh, the value of that is as an insecticide, and it works great on things like ants. It work, works great on a lot of uh, different uh, insects. It can help uh, with control of them. It's, a, it's an all-natural product. It comes from uh, mining of diatoms that were once the ancient uh, small critters of the sea. Very, very fine powder. Uh, you want to be careful and not breathe that powder. That's one of the, the downfalls of it. But uh, you can feel how fine that is. And a great natural, naturally occurring insecticide. I promise to talk about 
Well, green manure crops or cover crops. Cover crops would be where, uh, in an area that you're going to uh, have a garden in the future, so let's say it's summertime and this year you're really not going to do anything with that, but we don't want it to grow up into weeds, so we plant something like annual ryegrass in there. That ryegrass then we till under in the springtime and it provides a great uh, value as an amendment and providing some fertility into our soil uh, from a soil standpoint, from a weather standpoint and all that. You have a lot of things working against you. Uh, so it's pretty neat that we can end up with some great end products even though we have a lot of challenges on the front end. Questions? Um, yes? What about worms? Can you like introduce <coughs> worms into clay soil to make it better? Certainly you can. Now whether they stay, whether they thrive, whether they survive is going to be very, very questionable. Most of the worms that would be aggressive in a scenario like that, a red worm, is not going to overwinter here. So, I mean, you would have a brief period of time where it could do you good, do you some, uh, help you out. Uh, but anything you can do that's going to help with uh, more night crawlers, more worms, that kind of thing, is, is a soil building thing. And certainly the products, the casts of them, can be a, a great soil amendment and that and work in to the soil, so uh, anything we can do to promote them is very, very well. Those that the kinds that would be the most aggressive are not going to overwinter here. What's kind of like the easiest way to reduce the pH in the soil here? There really isn't one. There isn't. You know, adding sulfur, elemental sulfur, which you can buy, uh, it's going to be put on in a granular type form or whatever, just like a lot of the commercial fertilizers. Uh, although it's just strictly elemental sulfur, is going to help some. So if you had a, a, a garden area like the size of this room, to add two or three pounds of that would be way more than sufficient. Is it going to buffer that very much? Not very much. Some would help. And over time, uh, a lot of people say, well, what about uh, needles of the pine trees and those kind of things? Well, they're going to help some, and certainly in a forest type situation, if that's been a forest for eons, that, that pH there is going to be very different than it probably is in an open space where your house might be. Uh, but the decay on those also again ties up the nitrogen. So do you want to haul a bunch of needles in and put it in your garden? Probably not. Probably not. They probably, you're probably tying up and going backwards more than you're actually helping in that. What about those needles were applied to a compost that was going to then go in the garden? You know, I think over if it was well composted over time, I think it'd be very beneficial. Mm -hmm. I think it could be, but we can't. We need the correct carbon to nitrogen ratio in composting, so it can't be all needles. It can't be all lawn clippings. It can't be all. It's got to be brown, it's got to be green, it's got to be the mixture of the two. And of course we want to keep that ratio. So you can't just have one thing in your compost. It has to be a lot of different things. I've had a lot of people ask about um, coffee grounds and eggshells too. You know, I'm absolutely in favor of the use of <coughs> coffee grounds. Uh, Going to help with our soils in our area. Uh, one of the things that I do for house plants is uh, I grind my own coffee oftentimes and it's pretty, the beans are not ground fine, they're pretty coarse. And I put those on the top of my house plants. And so most of my house plants have an inch to two inches of rough ground coffee beans that went through my hand grinder and then we're used in the in the making of coffee and I can even tell you the coffee I like so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, and then I put them on there and, and I think it works good in, for a lot of reasons uh, from the plant growth thing I think it all also helps uh, in insect control and I can't tell you why on that but I, th I think it's very very beneficial to use that outside absolutely I mean that would be great now 
the eggshell thing. I, you know, I mean, we're providing some calcium, but is it, is it in a form that's very available to the plant? I would question that. I, you know, I mean, my grandmother was a way better gardener than I am. My mom probably was a way better gardener than I am. They gardened to survive, you know, not to uh, for fun like I do. I don't have to have so much spinach or anything come from my house. So I do it for fun. Uh, and my grandma did just that. I mean, the coffee grounds and all. They didn't have a compost pile as such, but it went into the garden and certainly was turned under, uh, usually twice a year and that kind of thing. So I, I would tend to think there's a good value, but in that form without being ground up and break down and all that kind of thing, I don't know how available it would be to the plant. Certainly not, not a bad practice. You know, I wouldn't see anything bad in that. The, the problem when you get into backyard or home style composting usually runs into the fact that we put some excess fruit things in there or something sweet or something that attracts the skunk, attracts the bear, attracts XYZ that really XYZ we don't want at our house, you know. That's usually the problem in a backyard composting scenario. So most situations like that, I would avoid putting fruit and those kind of things into there. Anything else? I'll be back next month to see how the garden see going. how things are going, and uh, that's kind of my uh, schedule. I wished I could be over here m more often, that, but uh, I kind of come over for a uh, evening, and then I'm available the next day for consults. Uh, I do lots of diagnostic things. If you have problems with your plants, uh, problems with your yard, and that kind of thing, we're more than happy to certainly try and help you over the telephone like I do with lots of people but also when I do come over here if you've got hey this my yard isn't doing very good this year whatever I'm more than happy to come take a look at it and uh, we're lined up to do that this summer again too so we'll be happy to do that thank you Thanks. Thanks.